As promised, here's my report on what is, for me, often the highlight of the event year, Symbian's smartphone show in London's Excel Centre. Not so much for the emphasis on this particular OS, but for the way in which most of the industry contacts I need to catch up with are present, and most importantly, the events actually in the UK. As you may know, I'm terrified of these newfangled flying things with wings. Although the number of new smartphones launched was low, there were still a number of very interesting technologies outed for the first time. Let's start with Nokia's announcement of their own S60 Touch UI, intended to be 100% compatible with existing S60 3rd edition applications, but adding finger or stylus control and on-screen character recognition and keyboard options. Although the driving force behind the appearance of the Touch UI is pretty obviously Apple's iPhone, Nokia are hopefully implementing touchscreen options in a way that's sensitive to the existing S60 look and feel, and without throwing out the baby with the bathwater, as it were. Tactile feedback through pulsing each phone's vibration system when an on-screen button is pressed should help keep things within a traditional phone experience. We should be seeing touch-enabled S60 smartphones by the second half of next year. Uh, with Apple almost certain to have brought out an iPhone 2 worldwide by then, there's going to be a bit of a fight, you mark my words, and I'm going to be there to commentate. Symbian announced two new technologies officially and one unofficially. The official ones are ScreenPlay, a new set of graphics capabilities built into Symbian OS that will let applications easily write to graphics layers and create fancy animations and inline video streams, plus Freeway, a rewrite of parts of Symbian OS that should, quote, uh, provide broadband speeds in your pocket. On mobile broadband networks, Freeway means super-fast download speeds, high-quality audio and video streaming, and clearer voice over IP calls. Freeway supports Super 3G, LTE, WiMAX, and even beyond, with data speeds as high as 100 megabits per second, ensuring performance high enough to allow you to download an MP3 file in a few seconds. Symbian were also emphasising that Freeway also guarantees users smooth switching between connection types and networks so that they can remain mobile at all times. With Apple's OS X and various Linux OS each trying to come on board with 3G, 3.5G and beyond, with limited success so far, I can only repeat that creating a real-time telephony and network-aware operating system that works at very high speeds and which handles multiple demanding applications is hard. Very hard. Symbian OS is the clear leader in terms of pure technology, with Windows Mobile perhaps a year behind. Although, of course, Apple's UI expertise is arguably world-leading. It's not all about sheer speed. The unofficial Symbian launch was a demonstration of demand paging, a way of only loading into RAM the bits of programs that are actually needed. Not only does the speed up application launching, it means more free RAM, and this also helps keep things nippy. The N95 8GB that I waved at you a few minutes ago has the first implementation of demand paging from Symbian OS, and it's pretty impressive, at least compared to the slowish performance of the original N95. Most future S60 and I suspect UIQ smartphones will have demand paging, getting Symbian OS smartphones up to iPhone UI performance levels with a much more battery-friendly processor. In other news from the show, Motorola has bought its way back into Symbian OS by buying half of UIQ technology. You remember this is the interface that Sony Ericsson bought outright from Symbian. Given that Motorola used to be a Symbian licensee and shareholder, the situation is pretty confusing. The short answer is that Motorola do seem to be committed now to producing more Z8-like smartphones running UIQ, which can only be good. Samsung was the only manufacturer to show off brand new devices, the i550 and i560. The i550 is Samsung's first GPS phone with a candy bar design and latest HSDBA network speeds, while the i560 contains similar innards but is geared to the fashion market. Samsung was also showing its i450 launched two weeks ago, a music-focused dual slider with a big Bang & Olufsen Ice Power Amplifier and Speaker. All three smartphones will apparently ship before the end of this year. One thing I really like doing in the smartphone show are comparisons. Head-to-heads between competing devices. But that's a problem with this, the Nokia N95 8GB. Sure, I could compare it to the Apple iPhone, which shares its music and video capacity, plus Wi-Fi and clean black looks. I wanted to compare it to the HTC Touch, which also shares the Wi-Fi and the look and adds full Windows Mobile 6 with a library of third-party applications. But like the iPhone, it falls too far short in areas in which the N95 excels at image and video capture, navigation and connectivity. So I'm left with the N95 8GB taken standalone, and the only other device I can meaningfully compare it to is its predecessor, the original N95, upon which it's a big improvement. Let's get this into perspective though. The N95 itself has been selling around a million units worldwide in each quarter, so it's not too shabby, especially with the latest V12 firmware. 
but the N95 8GB adds obviously 8GB of flash memory, albeit at the expense of not being able to swap your own micro SD cards in and out, a necessary trade-off. The battery is chunkier too at 1200mAh, adding at least another 25% to the daily battery life, with the redesign of the back to accommodate the BL6F battery, meaning that the camera shutter has gone too, another trade-off that won't please everyone. Round at the business end though, the screen's larger at 2.8 inches diagonal and clearer in all lighting conditions with a hard coating that rather beautifully sits totally flush with the case sides, iPhone style. The slide mechanism is now more solid and doesn't leak light from the screen backlight. One small downside is that the case finish isn't quite as grippy as the original N95s and I somehow managed to drop the new version twice in the first 24 hours. Gulp. Extreme care needed, especially considering the price. The other improvements are all internal with four times the free RAM, making memory errors a thing of the past and demand paging added to the operating system to make S60 applications launch and run faster. The software is essentially the same as the original N95, but the S60 search application has now been promoted to the front standby screen and the way it quick matches text across the device is impressive, as you can see here. With the launch of Nokia's Ovi content platform, there's a new multimedia carousel with Engage Games, Image Slideshow, downloaded videos, music, including podcasts, and a shortcut to the upcoming Nokia Music Store, maps with shortcuts to recently viewed locations, web bookmarks, and manually chosen favorite contacts. My problem with this new carousel is that all the content at the moment simply duplicates functionality that's available on the usual S60 menu. However, as the parts of Ovi come online, Engage Games, the Music Store, location-based services and social networking, the carousel shortcuts may make more sense. For now, I'm a little sceptical though. The Engage section on the first production N95 8GB does include trial forms of FIFA 07 and Asphalt 3, shown here. Both games are pretty slick and bode well for the future of Engage, although they only play in portrait mode. I'd be interested to see if final versions will also work in the N95's landscape mode. Despite the overall improvements, it should be borne that this is still a Nokia N95 at heart. The screen still called a VGA and all text input is still via a number keypad. But as long as those two factors don't put you off, the N95 8GB is a staggeringly converged mix of S60 smartphone, professional 5 megapixel camera, DVD quality camcorder, satellite navigator and high capacity music player and I'm absolutely no doubt that it's going to sell just as well as its predecessor, both SIM free and on contract in phone shops across the world. Nokia N95 8GB You'll remember that a couple of months ago I was asking about possible solutions for editing smartphone short mp4 video files on the desktop. Thanks to all of you that emailed in, the favoured solution seemed to be simply get a Mac. Although the current Mac video editing solution, iMove V08 of V7.1, seems to be extremely dumbed down and just won't do what I need. Plus, of course, I've got several other applications which only run under Windows and going down the whole dual boot route is just such an extreme clutch. Under Windows, ULead Video Studio 10, my old solution, is still proving very unstable and won't work at all under my new Vista laptop. And I've settled for the time being on Cyberlink's PowerDirector 6, which offers a similar timeline-based interface and is reasonably speedy. Picture-in-picture uh, -picture effects, clip trimming, audio mixing and titling are all catered for, and I love the way audio tracks and titles are automatically locked to the appropriate video clips, so when you later insert something else, all your carefully synced audio and titles are still in the right places. The downside of PowerDirector 6 is that its output routines are just downright quirky. The presets, uh, e.g. iPod output and YouTube, work fine, but stray into tweaking the bit rates or codecs used in generic video files and all hell breaks loose. Still, it's given me a workable and stable way to handle all my smartphone produced MP4 video. It's fully Vista compatible, and I'd recommend you give the 30-day trial of PowerDirector 6 a go with your smartphone clips.